Hello there. Thanks for watching this week's video. If you end up enjoying what you see and want more, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and turn on notifications. There's literally nothing better you could do to let YouTube know that my stuff is valuable. If you'd like to further support the channel, head on over to my Patreon where you can support me for as little as one gold piece per month. If you want to show your support for the channel to the world, head on over to cnp-productions.com slash store and pick yourself up a shirt or sticker. These shirts come in black, navy, gray, and red, and in sizes from extra small to 2XL, with stickers coming in 3, 4, and 5.5 five and inch sizes. There's a new design that comes out each week, and these new designs are usually up three to four days before the video, so make sure to check back often. Now, without further ado, let's learn about the intricate relationships that led to the rise, overthrow, fall, and rebirth of TSR, and therefore, Dungeons & Dragons. In the early 70s, Gary Gygax and his business partner Don Kay were living their best lives. They were publishing RPGs, playing D&D, and founding Tactical Studies Rules. There was nowhere for the two to go but up. Sadly, only one of them would actually see the fruits of their labor, and Don Kay would die of a heart attack on January 31st of 1975, at the terribly young age of 36. His entire estate would be left to his wife, including his shares in TSR, of which he and Gygax had been the majority owners. His wife, Donna Kay, was TSR's accountant at the time and would keep that position until the summer of 75. By that summer, grief had overtaken her and she wanted absolutely nothing to do with Gygax, TSR, D&D, or what have you. As such, Gygax would take full charge and take over the accounting duties. Throughout this time, virtually since the death of Kay, the third businessman and partner, Brian Bloom, a game designer and entrepreneur, had been trying to coax Gygax into allowing his father, Melvin, to buy out Don's shares, now held by Donna, and allow the Kay family to separate themselves from the business as a whole. Though very reluctant through the process, Gygax did not have the capital to go ahead and buy out the shares himself. and. As such, Gygax would submit and Melvin Bloom would purchase the shares. Now, with the majority of the shares being held by the Blooms, Gygax had essentially become an employee at his own company. To add insult to injury, the Blooms would issue more stocks to be sold and would purchase all of them. In 1975, sometime after the summer, Gygax and the Blooms would incorporate tactical studies rules into TSR Hobbies Incorporated. Gygax would be allowed to hold the position as president with Brian as his vice president and secretary. At the same time, TSR would move out of Gygax's basement and into their first headquarters, which they would call the Dungeon Hobby Shop, and they would sell miniatures for D&D in the storefront. On September 26th of the same year, the assets of the previous partnership would be transferred to TSR Hobbies, and in October, TSR Hobbies would subcontract their printing and assembly work for the third print of Dungeons & Dragons, specifically the white box, which would sell out in five months. Now, some may find insult in this statement, but there is no better analogy that I can find as of writing this. Arneson was to Gygax, as Bill Finger was to Bob Kane. If Bill Finger hadn't taken Bob Kane's idea and found a way for it to stand out while also building an entire ensemble of characters, locations, and designs that were unique to the character, then Batman may never have become the icon he is today. Similarly, if Dave Arneson hadn't taken the baseline idea of Gary Gygax's chainmail game and added his own creative flair, the ability to play a single character rather than a group of characters, and the basic mechanics of the game, then Dungeons & Dragons would not be what it is today. Now, as I stated in my first episode on the subject, Gygax and Arneson had been trading rules and ideas back and forth since Arneson gave Gygax a tutorial of how to play the game just after one of the early Gen Cons. 
but the game was officially published without Arneson signing off on the final rule set. As it would with anyone, it can be imagined that this would have caused tension between these two men, and I believe it came down to who these creatives were as creatives. Gygax, much like myself, was a very rules-based person. Black and white, right and wrong, yes and no were how things were processed and written. If you look at his early creations like Jane Mail, you can see his propensity towards defining every single type of rule for every possible encounter or situation that the players may find themselves in. The more options, the more rules for how those options operate. Arneson, in contrast, was the kind of person who could fill in the gaps within any situation he found in his games with improvisation and creative freedom. He would create situations for players to find multiple ways of getting themselves out or enemies that had exploitable weaknesses. If a player wanted to do something, he would find a way to make it possible. Whether they knew it or not, these two creators were creating and becoming the two archetypal dungeon masters, the Railroader and the Sandboxer. A Railroad campaign is a campaign in where the dungeon master is telling the story that the players have to react to and work in. These players have to make decisions that would propel the story in the directions it is being told, or the actions would be overruled one way or another. In a sandbox game, the dungeon master has an idea of where the story is going in a larger sense, but the players have the freedom to decide how and when they want to get there, what they want to accomplish, and whether or not they even want to head in the direction they're being pointed. They can enjoy playing as a group and deciding for themselves what they find fun as well as how to have it. XP to level 3 and Matt Colville on YouTube have great videos on the subject and use Tolkien's creations as an allegory. I highly suggest going and checking them out. That same year, in 1975, sometime after TSR became TSR Hobbies, Dave Arneson would be hired on to write Blackmore, his homebrew world and the setting in which he taught Gygax how to play, as a supplement to Dungeons & Dragons. Previously, Gygax had created Greyhawk, his own world setting, and both would be extremely popular at the time. Regardless, these two would continue to butt heads creatively, and it would escalate enough to cause Dave Arneson to quit TSR. In 1977, despite no longer being a part of TSR, Arneson would publish Dungeon Master's Index, a 38-page booklet indexing all of TSR's properties at that point in time. Now, before his leave, TSR had agreed to pay royalties to Arneson for all D&D products, but when the company came out with Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, or AD&D, in that same year, they would claim it was significantly different from the original creation and therefore would not pay any royalties. In response, Arneson filed the first of five lawsuits against TSR in 1979. In March of 81, as part of a confidential agreement, Arneson and Gygax resolved the suits out of court by agreeing that they would both be credited as co-creators on the packaging of D&D products from that point on, and Arneson would receive a 2.5% royalty on all AD&D products. This provided him with a comfortable six-figure annual income for the next 20 years, but the tension would still continue. For nearly a decade, Dungeons & Dragons, and therefore Gary Gygax, would be under intense stress from outside perspectives on the product and its figurehead. In 1979, the death of James Dallas Egbert III would spark the fire of negative mainstream media surrounding the game. In 1982, Patricia Pulling's son would shoot himself through the heart and die. Blaming D&D for the death, she would form the organization Bothered About Dungeons & Dragons, or BAD. If you'd like a BAD shirt, head on over to cnp-productions.com store and pick yours up today. Gygax would defend himself and the game in a 60 Minutes segment that aired in 1985. When death threats started arriving at the TSR offices, Gygax would hire a bodyguard. Whether in spite or because of the publicity, TSR's annual D&D sales would increase to $16 million, and in January of 1983, the New York Times speculated that D&D might become, quote, the great game of the 1980s, much as Monopoly was emblematic of the Great Depression of the 30s. In my own opinion, if you go back and watch the 60 Minutes interview, 
for which I highly suggest that you do, you will see it is one of the most tainted news stories of the era. To me, it looks more like a hit piece than an actual interview. It is entirely structured around the idea that D&D is a bad thing and is a demonic source without giving really any headroom for Gygax to defend himself. It truly is emblematic of mainstream news reporting, and I highly suggest that everyone go and watch it. Now, Gygax had been a member of the Jehovah's Witnesses for most of his life, and had even been a door-to-door -door evangelist for a time. In fact, many of his writings outside of D&D spoke about his beliefs, but are largely overlooked or not thought of as being tied to his faith. For instance, as a tenet of his faith, he would go on record that celebrating Christmas was a sacrilegious act and should not be done. He made a specific effort not to fill his D&D books with his beliefs, as he wanted D&D to be accessible to people from any faith or none at all. He didn't want to be a gatekeeper for the minds of the players, and it took particular effort to make sure he wouldn't. Gary and Mary Jo, his wife at the time, had both been active members during the 80s, but many in the congregation were offended, not only by his smoking and drinking, which, though not entirely against the faith, had been frowned upon depending on the period of time, but also of his involvement with Dungeons and Dragons, which had widely been seen in religious circles as being satanic. It had caused enough friction that Gary and his wife would leave the congregation, though Mary Jo would continue to resent the amount of time Gary spent playing games. Simultaneously, he would continue to excessively drink and smoke, causing the two to argue frequently. Gygax, who began smoking marijuana when he lost his insurance job in 1970, began to use cocaine and had a number of extramarital affairs. Finally, in 1983, the two had a very bitter divorce. At the same time, the Blooms, wanting to get Gygax out of Lake Geneva so they could manage the company without his, uh, quote, interference, split TSR Hobbies into TSR Incorporated and TSR Entertainment Incorporated. Gygax became the president of TSR Entertainment Incorporated, and the Blooms sent him to Hollywood to develop TV and movie opportunities. Gygax became the co-producer of the Dungeons & Dragons cartoon, which lasted for three seasons and two years, for which it would lead in its time slot. Now, Gygax, newly single, took advantage of the time on the West Coast, renting an immense mansion, increasing his cocaine use, and spending time with several young starlets. Open the world of advanced Dungeons and Dragons action figures! Strongheart, Bronze Dragon, Warduk, Nightmare! Discover a world of mystery and magic. Stand back, Strongheart. You shall never have this treasure. All evil is no match for good. <laughs> Until we meet again. Advanced Dungeons and Dragons action figures from LJN. Pure magic. While Gygax was out in Hollywood trying to get a D&D movie produced, he received word that TSR had run into severe financial trouble back in Lake Geneva, and that Kevin Bloom, Brian's brother and the inheritor of Melvin's shares, had been shopping the company for six million dollars. He immediately discarded his film ambitions, and his vision of a D&D film would never be made. Upon returning to Lake Geneva, he was shocked to find that while TSR grossed 30 million annually, it was one and a half million dollars in debt and on the edge of insolvency. After investigating the causes, he brought his findings to the five other directors of the company. Gygax charged that the financial crisis was due to mismanagement by Kevin Bloom in the excess in inventory, overstaffing, way too many company cars, and some questionable and expensive projects, such as dredging up a 19th century shipwreck. Gygax demanded that Kevin Bloom be removed as company president, and the three outside directors agreed with him. However, the board still believed the financial problems were terminal and the company needed to be sold. In an effort to stay in control, in March 1985, Gygax excised his 700 share stock option, giving him just over 50% control. He appointed himself president and CEO, and 
Rather than selling the company, he took steps to produce new revenue-generating products. To that end, he contacted Dave Arneson with a view to produce some Blackmore material. He also bet heavily on the new AD&D book, Unearthed Arcana, a compilation of material culled from Dragon Magazine articles. And he quickly wrote a novel set in his Greyhawk setting, Saga of Old City, featuring a protagonist called Gord the Rogue. In order to bring some financial stability to TSR, he hired a company manager, Lorraine Williams. When Unearthed Arcana was released in July, Gygax's bet paid off, as the new book sold 90,000 copies in the first month. His novel also sold well, and he immediately published a sequel, Artifact of Evil. The financial crisis had been averted, but Gygax had paved the way for his own downfall. In October of 1985, the new manager, Lorraine Williams, revealed that she had purchased all of the shares of Kevin and Brian Bloom, and Brian had triggered his own 700 share option. Williams was now the majority shareholder, and replaced Gygax as president and CEO. She also made it clear that Gygax would be making no further creative contributions to TSR. Several of his projects were immediately shelved and never published. Gygax took TSR to court in a bid to block the Blooms' sale of their shares to Williams, but he lost. Sales of D&D reached $29 million in 1985, but Gygax, seeing his future at TSR as untenable, resigned all positions within TSR Incorporated in October of 1986 and settled his disputes with TSR in December of 1986. By the terms of his settlement with TSR, Gygax kept the rights to Gord the Rogue, as well as all D&D characters whose names were anagrams or plays of his own, for example, Irag and Zegig. However, he lost the rights to all other work, including the world of Greyhawk and the names of all the characters he had ever used in TSR material, such as Mordenkainen, Rubelar, and Tensor. You see, Williams was a financial planner who saw potential for rebuilding the debt-plagued company into a highly profitable one. However, she was quite disdainful of the gaming field, viewing herself as superior to gamers. TSR released the Forgotten Realms campaign setting in 1987. That year, a small team of designers began to work on the second edition of AD&D, and in 1988, TSR released the Bullwinkle and Rocky RPG, complete with a spinner and hand puppets. That same year, TSR released the war game based on Tom Clancy's novel The Hunt for Red October, which became one of the biggest selling war games of all time. In 1989, the AD&D Second Edition, or 2E, was released, and the new Dungeon Master's Guide, Player's Handbook, and the first three volumes of the new Monstrous Compendium, the Complete Fighter's Handbook, the Complete Thief's Handbook, and a new campaign setting, Spelljammer, all released in the same year. Under Williams' direction, TSR solidified its expansion into other fields such as magazines, paperback fiction, and comic books. Through her family, she personally held the rights to the Buck Rogers license and encouraged TSR to produce Buck Rogers games and novels. TSR would end up publishing a board game and role-playing game, the latter based on AD&D 2E rules. In 1990, the Ravenloft setting was released and Count Strad von Zarovich soon became one of the most popular and enduring villains. The West Coast division of TSR was opened to develop various entertainment projects, including a series of science fiction, horror, and action-adventure comic books. In 1991, TSR released the Dark Sun campaign setting. TSR would also release the first three annual set of collector's cards in 1991. In 92, TSR released Al Qadim, the first hardcover novel, The Legacy by R.A. Salvatore, was published that same year and climbed to the top of the New York Times bestseller list within weeks. That same year, the Gen Con Game Fair broke all previous attendance records for any U.S. gaming convention with more than 18,000 people. In 93, the Dragon Strike Entertainment product was released as a new approach to recruiting players, including a 30-minute video which explained the concepts of role-playing. 1994 saw the release of the Planescape campaign setting. By 95, TSR had fallen behind both Games Workshop and Wizards of the Coast in sales, and seeing the profits being generated by Wizards of the Coast with their collectible card game, TSR attempted to enter the market in a novel way with Dragon Dice. Similar to collectible card games, 
Each player started with a random assortment of basic dice and could improve their assortment by purchasing booster packs of more powerful dice. In addition to this initiative, TSR also decided to publish 12 hardcover novels in 96, despite a previous history of publishing only one or two hardcover novels each year. Sales of Dragon Dice through the game's trade started strongly, so TSR quickly produced several expansion packs. In addition, TSR tried to aggressively market Dragon Dice in mass-market bookstores through Random House. However, the game did not catch on through the book trade, and sales of the expansion sets through traditional game stores were poor. In addition, the 12 hardcover novels did not sell as well as expected. By 1996, TSR was experiencing numerous problems, as outlined by Shannon Applecline. Quote, CCGs were continuing to shrink the RPG industry. Distributors were going out of business. TSR had unbalanced their AD&D game through a series of lucrative supplements that ultimately hurt the long-time viability of the game. Meanwhile, they had developed so many settings, many of them popular and well-received, that they were both cannibalizing their only sales and discouraging players from picking up settings that might be gone in a few years. They may have been cannibalizing their own sales through excessive production of books or supplements, too. David M. Ewalt, in his book Of Dice and Men, adds that Spellfire and Dragon Dice, quote, were both expensive to produce and neither sold very well. Despite total sales of $40 million, TSR ended 1996 with little in cash reserves. When Random House returned an unexpectedly high percentage of their unsold stock, including the year's inventory of unsold novels and sets of dragon dice, and charged a fee of several million dollars, TSR found itself in a cash crunch. With no cash, TSR was unable to pay their printing and shipping bills, and the logistics company that handled TSR's pre-press, printing, warehousing, and shipping refused to do any more work. Since the logistics company had the production plates for key products such as core D&D books, there was no means of printing or shipping core products to generate more income or secure short-term financing. Despite high sales, the company was deep in debt and not profitable in large part due to no returns. 30 staff members were laid off in December of 96, and other staff left over disagreements about how the crisis was handled, including James M. Ward. In large part due to the need to refund Random House, TSR entered 97 over $30 million in debt. TSR was threatened with lawsuits due to unpaid freelancers and missing royalties, but TSR made enough money from the products already on the shelves to pay the remaining staff through the first half of 97. With no viable financial plan for TSR's survival, Lorraine Williams sold the company to Wizards of the Coast in 97. Before the corporate offices in Lake Geneva were closed, some TSR employees accepted the offer of transferring to Wizards of the Coast offices in Washington. Wizards of the Coast continued to use the TSR name for D&D products for three years until the third edition of D&D was released in 2000 under the Wizards of the Coast brand only. In 1999, Wizards of the Coast was itself purchased by Hasbro Incorporated. In 2011, Jason Elliott of the Roll for Initiative podcast would re-register the TSR trademark, finding that it had expired back in 2004. He then came up with an idea to launch the new company with assistance from early TSR and D&D contributors, including Luke and Ernie Gygax, sons of the now-deceased Gary Gygax, and Tim Kask, former editor of Dragon Magazine. Their first product was Gygax Magazine, announced alongside the TSR company revival in December of 2012. Wired reported that, quote, Elliot stressed that his TSR is a new company. Both Gygax brothers left the company in 2016 when the magazine ended. The company operated as TSR Games, producing the top secret New World Order role-playing game. Last month, yes, June of 2021, Ernie Gygax Jr. and Justin Lanasa would launch a separate TSR in Lake Geneva, where they planned to run the Dungeon Hobby Shop Museum and produce tabletop games out of the same offices first owned by his father. Elliot's TSR Games had announced that 
while they had owned the trademark since 2011, they had missed a filing date in 2020 and were looking at different options. Both would eventually change their names, Elliot to Solarian Games and Ernie to Wonderfilled Incorporated. While the name no longer exists, TSR lives on in spirit, and I believe it will always be around in one way or another. The game that invented role-playing and the company behind the game are forever tied to the fabric of pop culture, and its echoes will be heard for eternity. Gary would become a non-denominational Christian at some point in the 90s, and would become an avid and active user of early Christian message boards. Today, Dungeons & Dragons is one of, if not still, the most popular role-playing game in the world. With the 5th edition and early adopters that would livestream their games like Critical Role, High Rollers, or Just Roll With It, the game is more popular than it has ever been, and doesn't seem to be slowing down anytime soon. I, for one, am grateful that this game exists and that I've been exposed to it. Through the last year, it's helped me to keep close to many of the friends that matter most in my life, and it's been an escape from the heaviness of the week. I can take the time to set aside everything that I'm holding just to put myself into a place of imaginative bliss with a group of people right there alongside me. I can't wait for the day long from now that I can introduce this game to my children and see the same wonder in their eyes that has been felt by millions across the world. These last three weeks have been daunting to say the least, and coming up close to the 13th week mark has me nervous for the year to come. Regardless, I've enjoyed every single video I've made and the mountain of research I have to consume to put it together, but I'm fairly certain that Nothing beats the time, effort, love, and care that I've put into this trilogy. Thank you all so much for watching. These last three weeks have been a whirlwind, and the story I've presented is the most detailed thing I've done in a while. If you enjoyed this week's video, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and turn on notifications. There's literally nothing better you could do to let YouTube know that my stuff is valuable. If you'd like to further support the channel, head on over to my Patreon, where you can support me for as little as one gold piece per month. If you want to show your support for the channel to the world, head on over to cnpproductions.com slash store and pick yourself up a shirt or sticker. The shirts come in black, navy, gray, and red, and in sizes from extra small to 2XL, with stickers coming in 3, 4, and 5.5 and inch sizes. There's a new design that comes out each week, and these new designs are usually up 3 to 4 days before the video, so make sure to check back often. Next week, we talk about the woman who found out she had been sold on the black market decades after the event, and the man behind it all. I'll see you then, same bat time, same bat channel.